life is very much like a marathon. We all start off at the same line, we're all ready to go, and we start running. And everybody's got pretty much the same abilities and the same opportunities. We go to the same schools, we go to the same colleges, and yet some people get way, way ahead. The mass stay in the middle, and some people fall so far behind they think they're first. And so why is this? And well, this has been studied for year after year, and we find this, this, one, this one single difference is the way you think. I was listening to somebody who grew up in a small town, uh, and he was talking about this interesting point. He said he came from a poor family, and there are three families in that town that ran and owned everything. They owned the mill, and they owned the factory, and they owned the general store, and they owned the shipping, and they owned the trucking, and they owned the agricultural processing, and they owned everything. And these three families were rich, they had beautiful homes, everybody revered them and talked about them, and they were on the bank boards and everything else. And he went to school with the kids from these three families, and you know, everybody wanted to be their friends, of course, you remember those days? Uh, and he found they were quite normal kids, and they weren't very different from anybody else. But somehow these families owned everything, and it was a real shock to him. It wasn't their education, because they weren't getting a better education than he was. There weren't their great, the grades, because the grades were the same. It certainly wasn't their physical attractions or anything else. It was just one thing, they thought differently. They had, they had an attitude of looking for opportunities and possibilities. And what we have found, a series of articles in Inc. Magazine, they were interviewing people who'd become fabulously successful, rags to riches stories. Every one of them said, the only reason I succeeded is because I developed the habit of always looking for the opportunity always looking for something good or positive in what I was doing. Whereas other people, they have a setback, they go, oh my God, wah, 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 and they go home and drink and, and watch television and so on. But successful people are always looking for the opportunity. They think differently. And so when you learn to think better, you make better decisions, you get better results. Interesting question, by the way, which comes first, the thought or emotion? Well, the answer is uh, thought comes first. Because according to the University of Pennsylvania, the way you translate something determines if you translate an event as being a positive event. You know, some, some people can be going out with a complete jerk and the jerk breaks up with them and stomps out. And they can say, wow, fabulous. Saves me all the problem by doing it. The other person can be decimated and depressed and everything else. Same event, different interpretation. So what they found is the way you interpret or explain things to yourself largely determines how you feel about them. And if you look for the good in everything, if you look for the valuable lesson, if you look for the possibilities, surprise, surprise, you always find something good or something valuable. A psychologist asked me this question, what do we use words for? And I said, to communicate. He said, yes, but there's more than that. He said, a word, he said, is a condensed thought. And a word contains many meanings. Some words can be very rich with meaning and all kinds of interpretations. Take a word like family as it applies to yourself. Take a word like love or children or, or home or take a word like freedom or, or financial independence you know, or success. These words are rich words. There's libraries full of books written on these independent individual subjects. So what they did, starting about more than 50 years ago, is they began just testing this thesis and testing people on how many words they could recognize. Like, pays to, pays to increase your word power from Reader's Digest. Did you ever read that? And you read it through and you're a little bit kind of disappointed that you missed half of them? You know, you ever had that experience? Wow. Well, what they did is they took people and they just analyzed how many words uh, out of the 4,000. By the way, if you want to know the 4,000 most common words in English, the words that they based the SAT on, the LSAT, uh, all the great tests. You just go to the um, internet and put it on Google and say uh, 4,000 most common words, and bloop, there it is, and you print it up. And it's about uh, 20 pages, and it just gives you the word and the word meanings. And if you know those words, it'll put you in the top 10%, 5% of Americans living today, just because you know the words. Anyway, so what they did is they tested people, and they asked them, how many words do you recognize? And then they uh, sorted them by socioeconomic level. There's seven socioeconomic levels in America, by the way. Uh, even though we are an egalitarian society, all societies have hierarchies, and we have a hierarchy. They found the people that knew the lowest number of words were inner city dwellers, and they had an average vocabulary of 400 words. Now, the English dictionary has about 650,000 words, and they knew 400. And some of them were words that are not repeatable in a family publication, and they were used as verbs, nouns, adverbs, and adjectives. Anyway, so uh, then they went to the next level, and they knew more, and they went all the way up, and they found that the people at the highest levels of society recognized the most words. So they said, well, let's test this as a thesis. And they took people out of corporations, um, people who had certain levels of management, and they just experimented for one year. They taught them five words a day. An average, say, 1,500 words in the course of a year. And watch what happens to their lives. 
Well, it was just astonishing. They learned the words so they could recognize them and use them. They were promoted two or three times. Their income went up 50 to 100 percent. They were up, moved up into management. Their social circle changed. The people they hung around with and wasted time with in the evenings changed completely. They started to associate with people who had higher vocabularies because you always tend to associate with people who have the same level of vocabulary as yourself. It's almost like cream rises. You start to rise like cream as your vocabulary increases. Now, why, why, why does this happen? It's because the more words you know, the better you can think because you have more tools to think with. You can think with greater subtlety. You can, you can analyze things better. You can make better decisions. So as you learn more words, you actually become smarter. And every brain cell, as you know, is connected to 22,000 other brain cells. So as you learn more words, you connect those with other words, which enable you to see things, to sense things, develops your intuition to a higher level, and it makes you more successful. So here's my next question. Who is the most important person here? Well, the answer is you. You are the most important person in your entire world. You are the most important person in the universe to you. If you have a split nail, it's more important than if 100,000 people are washed away by a flood in Bangladesh. Because every person is the center of their own universe. And this is just the way it is. People say people shouldn't be so selfish. That's like saying people shouldn't breathe in and out. You know, the fact is that each human being is self-centered. That's the, that's the nature of staying alive. And it's essential for survival. Well, uh, you are the most important person. You were important to your uh, parents when you were born. You're incredibly important. Look at these little children, these little babies. I mean, whoa, geez, they become all important. This is the most incredible transition takes place one day before, one day after you have your first child. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Your whole life changes. It's almost like your whole life is like the first stage of a rocket that falls away when your first child is born. It just falls away, and everything else was kind of preamble. It's kind of like sec of secondary importance. What's really important is what happens from now on. And so, uh, so, um, so, so you are very important to your parents. You are very important to, to your children. You're important to your friends. You're important to your patients. You're important to all the people whose lives you touch. And uh, you're going to get some opportunities to touch some additional lives after I've finished speaking. But, but touching uh, lives makes you one of the most important persons. What do we have coming up in 11 days? Ta da! Federal election. In the election 11 days from now, you walk into the voting booth and hey, right next to you, there's Bill Gates. And the other side, there's Warren Buffett. Jeez, these guys are the richest people in the United States. How many votes do they get? They get the same number of votes that you have. Your votes are important. You are an important person. Now, the reason I ask you this is because when I learned this, the, under, the underpinnings of this concept, it changed my life forever. How important you feel you are largely determines the quality of your life. How important you feel you are, how important and valuable you feel you are as a person largely determines the quality of your life. It determines how you think about yourself and how you feel. It determines how you treat other people. And the interesting thing is how you treat other people determines how they treat you. It determines your goals you set and how persistent you are in achieving those goals. It determines the amount you discipline yourself, how hard you work. Everything is determined by how important and valuable you feel you are. Now, psychologists call this your level of self-esteem. And your level of self-esteem is like the reactor core of a nuclear generator. It's the power source of your personality. People who have positive personalities have high self-esteem. People who have weak personalities have low self-esteem. And wonderful thing, as Ed was saying, you can raise your self-esteem by the way you talk to yourself, by the people you talk, associate with, the way you talk to yourself. And so when you say the words, I like myself, your self-esteem goes up. So say it, say, I like myself. Oh, come on, take your thumbs out of your mouth. Jeez, it's almost 11 o'clock. Say it like you mean it. Say, I like myself. Wonderful. Now, when you get up in the morning, say, I like myself. I like myself. Throughout the day, say, I like myself. I like myself. But even if you just listen to someone else saying, I like myself, your self-esteem goes up. You just like, you feel good. It's the three most positive words in any language. I just was teaching the same thing in Russia uh, a week ago uh, and in uh, Rome uh, a week ago in Germany. I, and I'll be in China next week. I can't believe it. I'll be in China on Thursday. And I'll be teaching the same thing in China and throughout China and Malaysia. Because the more you like yourself in any language or culture, uh, the more you like other people. The more you like other people, the more they like you right back. Do you know that 85% of our success or a lack of success, happiness or unhappiness in life will be determined by our relationships with other people? 85%, only 15% is determined on other factors. The other 85% is our relationships. We, the biggest problems we have in life always come with hair on top. Have you noticed that? And, but the more you like yourself, the more you like other people. The more you like other people, the more they like you right back. 
And the more they like you right back, the more they want to use you and come to you, uh, your practice and to recommend you to others. What is the number one key to getting referrals? Do you know what it is? Are you ready? It's a toughie. It's be referable. Be referable. How do you be referable? Be a nice person. Do you know what the number one word used to describe, to describe people to, to whom we refer others to? The he or she is a nice person. They are really nice people. They are really nice people. You know what nice people means? High self-esteem. You walk into a dental practice where the people are grumpy and say, sit down there, we'll call you when you're ready. You know, all right, all right, it's your turn. What's your name? Trashy? Uh, no, Tra- Tracy, all right, all right, whatever. Get, the hell. Get in here. All right. And, uh, and then the other looks at your teeth and says, oh my God, what a terrible job. Whoever's been working on your teeth before. I mean, you should have come here years ago. It may be too late. I mean, I mean, uh, and then you go into another practice and everybody's cheerful and they recognize you and they say, hi, how are you doing? Please sit down. We'll call you in a minute. If there's a delay, they say, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a delay. Uh, can you hang on? Can we get you a glass of water or something? And you sit there and you feel special. So what is the key to building a successful practice? Of course, you must have the technical knowledge, but the key is make patients feel important. Make patients feel important. From the time they come in, make them feel important and make them feel valuable, raise their self-esteem. And you know the fastest way to make a person feel important is when they walk into your practice? Smile at them and say, hi, how are you? Thank you for coming, nice to see you today. How's everything going? So the first impression is like a wave of warmth and their self-esteem goes up and they feel valuable and important. And the last thing you do is you say, thank you for coming. We sure enjoy having you. Hope, look forward to seeing you again. And uh, if we can be of any service to you, please give us a call. And if something comes up, let us know. So the last impression makes them feel important. And in between, treat them like they're the most valuable people in the world. And I promise you, you have to, you'll have to turn your phone off to keep people from calling to make appointments because they're, because once you make people feel important, their friends will all want to send people to you. Anyway, it's a small thing, but how much you like yourself is important. Now, here's the second thing we find that really top people in every field love their work is they don't look at their work as you know, and get through this. They love their work. And only, you could only be successful if you love your work, if you're doing something you really enjoy. Now, there will be mornings when you will get up. And so what, what they say is, I love my work. Say, I love my work. Whoa, oh, time to look for another field for some people. Say, I love my work. Wonderful. Now, there will be mornings when you get up and you will not say, good morning, God. You'll say, good God. <laughs> it's morning. <laughs> But you can get yourself cranked by talking to yourself in a positive way. Remember, 95% of your emotions are determined by how you talk to yourself. So you get up and you start saying, I like myself. I love my work. I like myself. I love my work. I like myself. I love my work. I like myself. And you can't say this three or four times without starting to smile. And you go downstairs and you're smiling. Well, what are you smiling about? Well, I like myself and I love my work. And, and you know something? When, you, when a person walks into your practice, they know if you like yourself and you love your work. They can tell. And if you've got people in your practice that I don't care how competent they are, if they don't like their work and they like, like themselves, get rid of them because they are cancers that will destroy your practice. Because everybody who comes in touch with them says, I'll never come here again. 